Hey, welcome to the podcast. My name's Jamie. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> so this one, this podcast is about our good friend Willow. Um, they were, a, I don't know, when did they come on the podcast? Um, oh, it was like Ju- June or something. We spoke to Willow and we had such a good time. We went and met them in Brighton. Uh, in like late August, early September, yeah. because we wanted to go meet them in person, and got our portrait and stuff yeah. like that. So we've we've done a lot. Two different occasions. I had a portrait yeah, taken went... by Willow with me and my missus, and then I went back to Brighton with you and your family to also meet up with Willow. So yeah, I take your portrait of you and the family as well. So we've got them scans of those pictures in here. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, so Willow does like tin type, um, is that the right way of saying yeah. it? Yeah. Tin type wet plate photography. <sighs> wet plate, that's the one. Crazy. Yeah, lots of people uh, will like know about their work and all that sort of thing, I think. Yeah. But if you don't, it's all very interesting. And Willow is just like super cool. Um, they also do a lot of um, yeah, like street photography, but very analog purist. Um, there's not a lot of digital stuff going on with Willow, so. but anyway, yeah, they're t- they're a top person to speak to. Really interesting, and for sure, we're going to see them more in the future. But yeah, it was a really fun episode. Stay tuned for this one, and drop us a comment if you want to be on the podcast down below. Drum roll, please. If you want to start off by introducing who you are and how you got into photography. <laughs> um, yes, yeah, so um, I'm Willow. Obviously, I think most people probably know me as Wet Plate Willow these days. Um, so, yeah, um, I've been doing, I suppose I, I first started taking photos probably about, oh God, like 12 years ago now. Um, back in, funny enough, um, it used to be skate shots. Um, yeah. Obviously, um, having prior met you, Jamie, and found out you skate as well. Um, but yeah, I, I we basically I, I grew up in a, a little area where we had like um, we we were just skating all the time. It's all we thought, all we did really. And um, we had one guy who, who was a videographer. He had he bought like a little terrible video camera for like fifty quid, slapped a thirty pound fisheye on it, and we used to film ourselves. Um, and I realised that because I started getting some knee issues, so I started realising I had to settle down a little bit. And I was like, no, well, no one takes photos. So I just naturally kind of found myself going into that. And I had a lot of years of influence from my dad because he always had cameras around him. It wasn't like super in-depth on his photography. Um, so, yeah, I started doing skate photography. And then as I kind of uh, grew up and started going through certain uh, stages in life, I guess, and especially going into early adulthood and trying to work out like work and stuff like that, I set the cameras down for a long time. Um, and it wasn't until actually I moved into the Brighton area about uh, probably five years after that, I really picked up the cameras again. Um, so I say I've been solidly doing it in the last seven years, mm. probably no, five or six years, sorry. Um, and yeah, basically it was it was like my way of finding escape. Like I, I kind of went for a stage of being agoraphobic and wasn't really leaving the house too much. Mm. And then um, the, I, I Basically, one day when I was at work, I had a, someone I recognised came in with a camera by his side, and I just thought, "Oh, that's a talking point right there." And he invited me out to take photos, so I picked up the old camera, buffed off the buff, like brushed off the dust, and took myself out with him. And since then, I've not really looked back. I started photographing the streets of Brighton, and that was kind of how I got over the agoraphobia. Mm. And uh, lo and behold, now I all I do is talk to people and try and take their photos. So. It's been quite a step, but um, yeah, it's um, what was kind of like the main thing that got me into photography again, really, was just this, I guess, this silly small talking point with someone who just had a camera by the side and just kind of reminiscing on the times where I took skate photos back when I was younger. Mm. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's been quite therapeutic, I guess, for me. And it's why I probably dove in so hard with the photography is just because it was it was an escape from my own home I guess and now I just don't look back I go for wonders with two or three cameras at a time usually my heaviest ones get a nice bit of exercise out of it but um 
yeah, it's, you know, even though you're heaviest cameras, which I know, I know you've got the same as me or had the same as me. You had the Mamiya RB67. Yeah. So yeah, you say, you know, you're walking around, that's good exercise. Fair play, because that is a heavy camera. But nowadays, you're walking around with a whole dark room. Yeah, yeah, I do that. So, yeah, I feel like that's probably a little bit harder than just carrying a bog standard camera. Yeah, um, that, that is definitely a different one. Um, so fortunately, most of the time when I'm taking my dark room out, it's kind of like a pre-planned yeah, thing. Yeah. But I've got a set destination. I know where I'm kind of going for. But there have been a couple of times where I've hauled that dark room out with kind of like no idea of what I'm actually going to do. I just wanted to take a photo. Mm. Um, and yeah, it's, I think it's roughly clocks in at about 20, 25 kilos of equipment I carry around. Yeah, um, yeah and this, yeah. I've got this little cart. And I don't know if, um, have you been to Brighton, Luke? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so you probably know how poorly cobbled the pavement is yeah. nearly everywhere. So I'm crawling yeah. around like this dark room full of very disgusting, horrible, explosive, carcinogenic chemicals. You can hear <laughs> them like, rattling around inside. Um, but yeah, it's that's definitely an exercise in itself. But my most recent kind of trips, I've been going out with the, my Intrepid 4x5 and my Mamiya. So I'll load up my Mamiya in the bag and then just carry my Intrepid kind of over my shoulder and wait until I find something I can set up with. Um, so yeah, that's... Uh, I, I just I like carrying a lot of weight, I guess. I like like making my life difficult, you know. Uh, <laughs> but but worth it though, right? We'll we'll get into the whole wet plate thing as well, but just to take it back to kind of like getting into photography, I, we'll get into photography or rediscovering photography, should I say? Yeah. I was exactly the same, right? So photography always appealed to me because like skateboarding. I, I've spoke about this before, and then I put the camera down, but it kind of never leaves you, right? Like you still like. I think from the skateboarding side, you appreciate like the arts that are involved with not just the skateboarding itself or a sport yeah. itself, but everything that kind of comes with that. And I almost guarantee that you probably still read magazines or watch videos or whatever it might be. And it was, it never disappears, does it? What you know, once you once you're a skater, you're always a skater, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. We'll have to drop, we'll have to drop the the link into the description of this video that you sent me of you skating. <laughs> so, so good. I, I, I haven't sent it to you yet, Luke. But no, no, no. I sent Willow a little video of me skating forever ago and Willow did the same. So good. Really, really yeah, good. It's like me when I was like 13. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Good though. Yeah. But yeah, oh, so yeah. then obviously you picked up the camera, but I don't want it to go unnoticed because obviously we'll predominantly talk about your kind of wet plate photography style, mm. but you are still a very good photographer that doesn't just specialise in wet plate, right? So you, yeah. you, have, you know, you have your own body of work that is, you, you know, you, is it fair to say that you kind of predominantly focus on like portraiture work, but you still got your own photography on, on the side of that as well, right? You're, you're still a photographer at heart who wants to pick up the camera when they see something nice. Yeah, yeah. So um, I'm, I'm the main work that I kind of will especially feature and post up and for instance, and this is probably the work I'm most proud of tends to be my portraiture work. Yeah. Um, but yeah, if, if I do still shoot street like um, there's I know on my kind of, yeah, well, I have two Instagram accounts. I've got like one that's kind of my film work and then one's my wet plate work. Um, but on the film one, there is a couple of like street shots on there um, that I did mainly on a walk with a friend of mine, like a local friend of mine. Um, but it's something like, it's kind of something that stayed close to my heart. And again, I think the street work, for me, I nowadays, I do, I do it more for me um, in the sense of, because it was kind of like my, that was my main escape from things. Like I still do that to this day. Like if I'm mainly taking street photos, it's usually because I've got like something going on. I just want to escape from it for a little bit, just go wandering with my camera. Um, and most of the time I'm not proud of the shots. I think most of the time they're terrible. But for me, it's more like the process. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We, we, we've said it a lot on this podcast, but I'm going to say it again because I feel like it's important. But photography is a massive, massive um, thing. We've always supported it in terms of how good it is to go with your mental health. Like you said, going out, just having a walk for 20 minutes, an hour, a weekend, whatever it might be. Yeah. It's really good for your mental health. Like it, it, it is an escapism, right? Because you're thinking, like you're not thinking about work, you're not thinking about the stresses or problems that you've got going on in life. You are thinking about light and what looks good. Do you know what I mean? Because you're what yeah. you're, you're in that photography mode, right? Like you're like, oh, yeah. that. Oh, how can I, how can I frame this? And before you know it, you've done thirty thousand steps and you've shot 
in Luke's case, maybe 50 rolls, average person, <laughs> one or two. Yeah, for me, like most of the time when I do these walks, I don't even get through a roll. I'll take like mm. two or three photos. I'm mm. I'm really picky these days. That's my problem, if I'm honest. But mm. like again, for me again, it's I think it's more like I I like the walk as well. But to have something to do whilst you're just going for a walk is always so much better. And if you can create art from that, then do it. You know. Um, and again, it is that kind of thing where. Yeah, I, it, I find it is wonderful for mental health because it kind of you you end up not having to think about the things that are causing those kind of distresses and naturally again thinking more about your angles with like your color theory if you're shooting color for instance or even for me like a lot of the time yeah because I've been doing a lot more black and white again recently as much as I prefer color um I've been looking at more like contrast values so when I've been looking at situations I've been thinking more about the contrast values in those situations and it, it is that kind of like distraction, I guess, sometimes that you need just to kind of settle you from those situations. And for me, that's always been a great part of it. So mm-hmm. like even portrait shoots for me that that can work out is that because maybe it's more like someone, I, a friend of mine, someone who's close, just gives you an excuse to go and see them. And you'd be like, oh, I want to practice taking some portraits and I want to get my gripes out. And they'll sit there and listen to you and you just take a couple of like test portraits or something like that. like. Um, I don't know if that's something that everyone has, but I'm quite fortunate in the fact I've got a kind of circle of people in the area here, which are like like minded. They'll do similar things. Um, but yeah, for the most part, but like, like the old street kind of walks and stuff like that, I've realised I've gone so far away from the point. I was talking about street work and shit. No, no, that's cool. That's cool. <laughs> yeah, that's cool. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 one of the questions I actually had was about the portrait stuff that you do, or maybe 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 it's more like you're you're gravitating towards that, right? And I, to be fair, I've recently got that kind of bug where, and Luke will tell you, like me and Luke go out for walks maybe once, twice a week, even if it's just on like, usually just on like a lunch break or something, right? And Luke's always yeah. looking at things, he's like, is that interesting? Is that interesting? He's looking through his camera. Where me, I'm like, I've gone more down that road of really slowing down my photography. And then I'm, I feel like I'm more drawn towards taking a portrait or stopping and having a chat with someone and asking me if I can take their photo. But that doesn't mean that, I'm right, Luke's wrong, or whatever. It might be the case that I wake up tomorrow and it's a role reversal, right? And that's the beauty with photography. Yeah, but I was yeah. going to ask specifically about your portraits, or your should I say street portraits? Are they normally like something where you've or not organised a shoot, but you're jamming with one of your friends for the day, or whatever it might be, and you just happen to take some photos, or is it just the case that you're you don't know them, or have they booked in with you? Um, so a lot of the time it's um, generally kind of pre-planned stuff with a lot of my portraiture. Um, I <laughs> I still suffer from the occasional anxiety with regards to talking to people on the street. But the other thing is as well is, um, especially recently where I've been doing a lot more large format sheet film work, I feel like it's kind of awkward to tell up to someone and say, oh, do you want to take your photo? And be like, oh yeah, sorry, let me just set up this and I have my hood mm-hmm. and get my focusing out and stuff like this is it's so long-winded and you know that person's probably like I, I need to go to this place now you've taken 10 minutes to set your camera up so yeah. um that's one issue I'm kind of suffering at the moment with that but um yeah it's, it's one of those things that I think it also I tend to more so do those kind of asking people in the street when I generally have company of some sort someone who's clearly a photographer as well and I think that just comes from the fact that I know uh like when you're in the city or something like that some random person coming up to you and just asking you a question some people it just releases so much sense of panic in them and i worry that doing that to them and i think it comes from because i used to be bald-headed with gigantic beard tattoos out and stuff like that and as much as i'm not a big figure i'm five foot eight and i weigh about 60 kilos i'm tiny um it's it's one of those things where it probably looks intimidating. Imagine like some random person like tapping on your shoulder. It turns around as me with a wild beard, shaved head, <laughs> looking probably a little bit like wired out or, or tired from just something. And like just being like, oh yeah, can I take your photo? I just, I, I worry that it comes across weird, I guess. Yeah. And I, I always get anxiety. But if I have someone else with me, um, I generally have a little bit more confidence. But I think just... that's a massive thing. Like, I, I said that to Luke the other day, like having him there or, if I'm walking around with someone, it's a huge confidence boost because, and it's not because you're like worried about getting into a fight. It's more of like getting into an awkward conversation. 
where with your with when you're with someone, you've got oh yeah, we're just out taking photos. You you can see he's stood there with the camera. I'm stood over here with the camera. Or do you, yeah. know, do, do you know what I mean? You have that kind of safety blanket. Um, yeah. And it, I don't know why, but it, like if I go out and shoot on my own, I'm so much more nervous. Like it, it's it, that's half the battle is just like wanting to take a photo that I actually want to take because you just feel like a bit of an idiot stood, stood there. Do you know what I mean? But when you're with someone, yeah. all that pressure all that pressure goes away yeah that, i think that is a, i think to be fair it's a common issue for a lot of um photographers and i think by nature photographers tend to be a little bit on the mildly anxious side of life yeah. um, that's why we want to be behind the camera not in front yeah. of you exactly you know like, i've been trying to force myself in front of the camera a little bit yeah. more recently um but you know just to kind of again ease that anxiety and also just to understand what it's like to be on the other side but um, yeah, it is that thing. We're, we're all kind of somewhat anxious people. And I think we all have that kind of fear in the back of our head that we'll get that one person who's like, oh, no, 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 gets all like arsy about it and then probably grabs your camera, smashes it off the floor. And then you're like, oh, no, like that's a yeah. 1,000 piece of gear, 1,000 pound piece of gear just smashed into pieces on the floor because this one person got upset, like, oh, stick, I could take their photo. That's always like the, the thing that's in the back of my head and it always plays with me. So I'd rather not risk that because at least if you've got someone else with you, he's going to decide which camera they're going to go for. And then you'll just be like, ah, oh, well, I'm getting the fuck out of it. So, mm. um, cool though, because like even like, we're, we're, you know, I was fortunate to meet you a couple of weeks back now. And, you know, you took a portrait of me and my fiance, yeah. which is awesome. And, we, you know, we can talk into that a little bit. But you, you were saying like how often someone stops and talks to you just because out of pure interest of like the camera that you've got set up, right? You've got a large format camera, mm. you've got a dark room set up. Um, and the amount of people that will stop and talk. I mean, I like I, I think I took maybe four or five random portraits of people in the few hours that we we hung out, right? Yeah. And that was that was just people that stopped and asked what the hell you're doing. Do you know what I mean? Not in not in a not in a harsh way. They they were just uh, right? I'm gonna give you credit on one though. There was one which was not anything to do with me, which is the guy on the cycle. I, I, so I, I literally was thinking about that earlier. I've just finished scanning all these photos in, and for the life of me, I can't remember seeing that. So I don't know if I've just misshot it, but I need to look at the next again because I, I even said to Luke the next day, I was like, "There's a photo that I took that I'm really excited about. It's a yeah, portrait yeah. of a guy on this on this bike." And yeah. for the life of me, I can't remember seeing it. But um, <laughs> yeah, so I'm really hoping that that one comes out because that was that was up there, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're, you're really good at asking people. Like when we go out, I I can't do it. But like today, even when there, there was, we saw this guy like sat on this little like tractor behind this shop in town, and Jamie's like, oh, "I'll go and ask him to take a photo." And walk, you was like sat walking over to him, and you're like, "Nah, I don't want to. I don't. I don't want to take that photo actually." And, and even then, did, when you sat about walking three over, cans deep of beer, and I was just like, "Is it worth that aggro?" Yeah. Do you know what I mean, like, I felt. Yeah, and like, I just went over, and I'm like. Eh, and yeah. run away <laughs> like it's a bio, just, yeah. <laughs> yeah but um, uh, yeah i can't do it i just feel even when you go and do it i feel weird mm. i just feel but but they always say yes so i don't know what it is really don't know but there you go I, I always just try and remember like what is the worst that can happen they say no but easier said than done do you know what i mean yeah See, well, i suppose in my head the worst thing that could happen is that yeah they beat the hell out of you and smash your camera like that's where my head just goes to but i think one thing is it's just having the confidence i yeah. think if you go up kind of somewhat anxious that you the person gets uncomfortable because they're like oh why is this person anxious to do it mm. i think if you go along and be a bit more like personable a bit more like more like i guess open in regards to like interaction then you're naturally going to have someone who's going to feel that same way back um, I think you're open to have a conversation as well then mm. that always helps so, so to be fair after me and Vicky left Judy the other day I walked along the seafront a little bit while she was chilling on the beach mm. and I got talking to uh, no underestimation she must have been 100 years old this woman <laughs> so so nice but I, I stopped her I asked if I could take a portrait and she was like yeah and I got talking to her for five minutes and to be fair I felt like a bit of an idiot like and she didn't she wasn't posing or anything like that took uh, do you know what? I'm actually really really happy with the portrait that I took I'll show you in a little bit uh, yeah but she was saying that she lived in Hove not Brighton 
So yeah. obviously we, we were in Hove, right? Not Brighton. But I always just say Brighton and Hove or Brighton. Like everyone knows it as kind of one place, right? And she was like, no, the tourists are all down in Brighton. Look how busy the beach is today. All the tourists have made it from Brighton and they've worked their way up to Hove. And I was like, yeah, those pesky tourists. And there's me standing there as a tourist. Going, I'm just going to take a photo of you on the most touristy spot in Brighton, like on the seafront. Um, but yeah, it, she was so nice. Do you know what I mean? But I had a conversation with her. I had, I had to put in that time with her to be able to get the result that I did. Um, mm. And I would and like, even if the photo didn't turn out as happy as I was with it, I still would have been happy with the experience of kind of standing there and talking to someone, right? Yeah. That's it. Like, it's, that's not a big reason why I take portraits in the end is, from, again, coming from a situation of kind of like avoiding any kind of interaction with people in general, I found myself kind of enjoying more than anything those kind of interactions with people. And it's in those kind of like portrait uh, sessions that I guess that I, I find the most sense of joy at the moment and it's just that getting to know people and their kind of stories and stuff like that up until that point like obviously I have people come and get tin types and stuff like that done and obviously you spend the time kind of asking about them their life and if it's like a couple you ask them how they met and stuff like that and it's just always kind of interesting to hear like the different stories like that I mean, you kind of have to get to know them a lot quicker than you kind of maybe normally would right like in the pub or yeah out and about wherever it might be so like and and you kind of like I don't know like I enjoyed talking to you I, I'd consider you a friend now even though we've only met that once right or twice yeah. now yeah but yeah, yeah. We, we we opened up to each other somewhat yeah not in a weird way we, we opened up we got to know each other and that to me was an experience and you know as soon as we left Vicky said to me she was like I completely understand why you wanted to get that done because like nothing, nothing against you and the kind of wet plate photography thing mm. My missus, she doesn't really understand everything when it comes to my obsession with photography, right? So I was like, yeah. I want to go to Brighton. We both love Brighton. We've always wanted to live there once upon a day. But I was like, look, I want this. We can do whatever you want Friday and Saturday. But on Sunday, I really want to go meet Willow and get this portrait taken. And I promise you. And like, she's like, oh, what's it going to look like? And I was like, it's going to look really old. It's not going to look perfect. It's not going to be super smooth. But it will be an experience, and yeah, you'll look yeah. at that photo for for the rest of our time together, right? And it will be a cool thing to have. And she yeah, yeah. got it afterwards. She was like, "That was awesome." Do you know what I mean? Like that felt like a like a really laid back photography shoot. Not that we've got any experience with photography shoots, but mm -hmm. do you know what I mean, yeah. it was an experience. We remembered not just the photo, but the experience that we had shooting that photo with you. Do you know what I mean? And which is cool. Do you know what I mean? We get to cherish that for like the rest of our life, right? And yeah, yeah. having the actual tin plate as well is is just awesome. I mean, that's it. Like, that's that's the big reason why I love this, like, uh, the, the whole tin type process, which I suppose we should probably start dripping into a little bit now. Since yeah, but yeah, yeah. I was going to ask, like, I don't actually know. Done the intro now. Really? Let's let's educate Luke let's, and the rest of you. Yeah, what, what what is it? Like, how does it work? Example um, now. So, okay, you you want me from the the, the get go? We'll give you the whole run for it. Yeah. Yeah, but but, okay. but without talking for five hours, otherwise people might switch off. Actually, no, they won't because it's really interesting. <laughs> um, I reckon I can condense it. In, well, I've, I've kind of got into a routine of condensing it all down into about a 10, 15 minute conversation. Oh, so yeah. you're not going to uh, turn into a robot, though. Mm -hmm. uh, no, I'm going to I'm going to try and avoid like the usual sprints <laughs> that I go by. Um, we'll, we'll try and switch up a little bit. But um, yeah, I mean, so obviously what I do is is um, well, I do tin types currently, um, which is a part of what's called the wet plate collodion process. So the wet plate collodion process is a way of achieving uh, photographic images. Um, and it was like the first kind of openly accessible like version of photography. It wasn't patented. You didn't have to pay into it to kind of get it to understand how to do it. You didn't have to have access to patents and stuff like that. Um, but it was done in two ways. So you have tin types and amber types. Uh, tin types is done on sheets of, well, it was originally tin, but it's aluminium now. And then amber types is on glass. Um, obviously, I don't want to risk carrying glass around in my rickety dark room. So uh, we, we stick to tin for the meantime. Glass is happening in the future. Um, so, yeah, the, like the wet plate collodion process is an old uh, 1850s method of photography. It was kind of it was argued when it was invented it was either 1849 in the united states by someone i can't remember the name of or it was 1851 in the uk by frederick scott archer um it was uh, basically as a pro as a process it involves taking a substance which we call collodion 
uh, flowing it across the plate evenly. Uh, we then drip off the excess from the plate itself. That plate then gets dipped into silver nitrate for about four minutes, three minutes, doesn't really matter too much, but about three to four minutes. Um, and that's basically sensitizing the plate because inside the collodion that you uh, flow on the plate, it's basically the main thing that's made out of is nitrocellulose, um, uh, which is otherwise known as gun cotton, um, alcohol, ether, cadmium iodide and cadmium bromide. So when the cadmium iodide and the bromide react with the silver nitrate, they make silver iodide and silver bromide. Um, and those are the silver halide salts that we still look for in like photographic film to this day. It's the same kind of stuff. Um, so basically, once that's sensitized, I then have to shoot the plate, but then also develop it whilst it's still wet, hence the name wet plate. And the reason for this is where it was an early emulsion, the emulsion wasn't able to dry because when it dries, it becomes the photosensitivity is lost and it becomes unusable essentially. Um, but yeah, so what you, what you do is obviously I said, you got that plate ready, you slap it into a plate holder, which is kind of like standard for a large format camera. Um, you can shoot wet plates at any size. You just have to have a camera the size of the negative because it's a direct print. So if okay. you shoot you can shoot 35 mil ones, but it's going to be a 35 mil negative size, you know, it's yeah. going to be small. So the reason why we tend to do four by five is because naturally it's a direct print. You can't recreate it essentially. Mm. Um, but yeah, once it's um, shot, um, it's then developed instantly. Why? That's why I have a dark room uh, around with me whilst I do it. Uh, it's a really fast process as well. The development is usually anywhere between about 10 to 20 seconds, depending on the chemicals, their age, and just like uh, various other things like temperature and humidity can affect it too. But it's a very short development time. It's about 10 to 20 seconds. Um, and then once that's ready, you put it into then a bath of hyperfixer. So I use sodium thiosulfate fixer. Um, and that's when the magic happens, really. That's the bit that everyone really loves, because that's when the negative image basically turns into a positive before your eyes. So when I bring the plate out of the dark room, it's kind of like this weird, almost like blue like color. And it's quite clearly a negative. And then when I dip it into the sodium thiosulfate, it kind of all goes completely white and disappears. And then suddenly it just all all like the contrast detail and like the shadow details all kind of like start appearing before your eyes mm. it's, it's a really magical experience i think that's kind of what sells that experience for a lot of people as well is just seeing that kind of process happen right before your eyes um and then once that's done i then lay it dry out and i give it a bit of a varnish and it's good to go at that point so um i can get into ridiculous amounts of scientific detail if you want to or historic detail it's entirely up to you we <laughs> feel free to ask any questions it's no problem but that is like the process as a whole yeah but how how did you find out about it that's um, not that, that was going to be that's my the question. thing i'm like but yeah like i've what made you fuck I've, with it <laughs> i've never like so i've seen like the results and i've seen and they're quite like bi bizarre or like ghostly almost like some of the images that i've seen that you've created and then yeah. but like yeah but how did you even find out about it and learn about it and all that sort of thing well it, it all started because of um starting uh, uni um mm -hmm. so i started yeah i went into uni for photography i think when i was like 24 25 um it was basically that same friend of mine who got me back into photography he was doing a uni course and he was like you should come along and join in and i was like yeah go on then um so i got in there and it was not what I expected at all. I was thinking it was going to be more down the roots of talking photographic history and then looking at the more artistic aspects of things. But the course I was in was definitely heavily aimed more towards a commercial market. But then also on top of that, it wasn't very... It, the big problem was is everyone who was in that course was people who were generally looking to do um, still life or landscapes, um, macro photography. Basically, I was the only person there who liked photographing people. So a lot of the course became heavily like weighted towards people, well, projects which didn't necessarily rely on taking portraits, which for me, this wasn't for me. Um, so I lasted a whole three months in uni and then I was like, mm -hmm. nah, fuck this, I'm out. Um, but it was that kind of thought going into uni that I'd understand a bit more of the history of photography that I kind of just went, well, you know what? I'll just do the research myself. Um, because I'd already at this point 
basically started solely shooting analog um because I, I was shooting digital before um my first analog camera was actually my dad's first one that he bought in the 80s he gave it to me um and so i just started shooting the om this so was an olympus om 10 and i was just solely shooting that basically just, my digital was gathering dust and stuff like this um but yeah it, it was that kind of i loved the the whole idea of like how you just even get an image onto a sheet of film you know like that mm. whole chemistry aspect of it just like even down to the point of understanding how like prisms work and stuff like that just mm. to reflect the image in the right correct like in a way that we can understand it better the actual like yeah. scientific side of it rather than the, the pretty pictures mm. side of it, right? yeah I, I really like the tech so i come from an engineering background i was originally doing uh, motor vehicle um, mechanics and engineering stuff and then I, I went more down the engineering route so i think i've got a very technical mindset when it comes to a lot of things so and i also excelled in science when i was younger so um i did extremely well in biology chemistry and physics so i think going into it like having this kind of very technical mindset um I kind of wanted again to understand how that works and then when I found out how film itself worked then I was like well how did they even get to a point where they understood how this would work and then slowly drip fed my way back through um, and I got down to the 1850s where the wet plate collodion process was and I even looked into stuff that came before so obviously you got daguerreotypes and stuff like that but the wet plate collodion process was like the first kind of accessible portraiture form for especially like portraits because uh daguerreotypes kind of suffered with much longer exposures quite often than wet plate even though wet plate's known for its longer exposures too um but yeah i just i started like researching it and then i came across the wet plate process and that for some reason just stood out to me i think it was again it was that earliest form of portrait photography that kind of works well mm -hmm. naturally being someone who kind of like does portraits um and I, I just researched it i just looked into again how it started um like the chemical process involved in it um and then just understanding like the actual techniques involved because a lot of it is kind of like pouring techniques um and i benefit from the fact that i work in the coffee industry so for a period of time i was a barista so my whole job was pouring liquids in mm. certain ways so now i think naturally for me the reason why I kind of excelled quickly with the collodion process was because I was very much used to already pouring uh, liquids in various ways. So it kind of helped me with that. Mm. Um, yeah, I was researching these techniques and stuff like that for maybe, I think, three or four years. Um, I, I became obsessed with it. I would sit and watch YouTube videos about like tin type artists and like their kind of setups and the way they do things. Because the other great thing about the process is as much as there is an overarched, like bright way to do things, there are so many different ways to get to those points, essentially. Like you can do different collodion mixtures, you can do different developer mixtures, you can do so many different things. There is no like kind of set, like it has to be this, it has to be that. And I kind of like that flexibility and freedom in it. Mm. Um, but yeah, uh, I kind of lost my train of thought there. I was just gone off on a whole tangent. Sorry, uh, I, I, I get into this whole like waffly aspect. Um, cool. I'm sitting there spaced out like this is insane. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, no. um, so, so did you have to track down the kit? Was it is it hard to like get hold of and learn? Yeah, what, what advice it? would you give to someone who's looking to get into it? I guess. Well, be ready to break your bank a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah. if you're in the UK, get ready to get absolutely rammed by import tax because. Basically, there's no one in the UK really making the chemicals anymore. There was um, one company that was making the chemicals, but unfortunately, due to COVID and the, the pandemic, they had to shut down. Um, so if you're looking That's to... That's why get... you charge me so much then. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I'm joking, I'm joking. It's a very, very yeah. high price. The equipment is basically like... So I, it, that was actually kind of perfect timing in that question because after the four years, I kind of just had a breakdown and I was just like, right, I'm buying everything. I'm just doing it and um bought a large format camera and all the gear um so all the chemicals i use currently um well for the most part um i use like pre-mix stuff so it's actually stuff i have to buy from the czech republic it's the nearest accessible place to get a lot of the chemistry you need yeah. um unless you mix it yourself which um i've now started doing certain kind of like bits myself so i've just started mixing up my own ferrous sulfate developers and stuff like that 
I'm going to do a little bit of experimentation with adding uh, copper sulfates into it as well to see if that helps uh, flow the plate differently. Um, Might be worth just, just to say, as a warning or a disclaimer, <laughs> don't mess with this if you don't know what you're doing. Like, oh, yeah. yeah. Like, it, it, it can kill you, right? Like, is that fair to say? Like, it's yeah. not good. Yeah. Like, just, just from watching your hands on do it, with gloves on everything. If you are looking to get into it, 100% do that. But don't do anything you're unsure about. Reach out to Willow, reach out to someone else, whoever it might be, your local camera shop. Keep your net about you. <laughs> yeah, so basically nearly nearly all the chemistry I use is either flammable, explosive, or carcinogenic. So it's not ideal, um, and it is something you really do have to be safe with. Um, so again, coming fortunately from a background where I've worked in engineering, I've had a lot of experience with uh, COSH, as we call it, which is obviously control, uh, control of substances, hazardous to health. So I take a lot of care and a lot of um, serious practice involved when I operate with my chemicals. It's not something to be, like kind of toy around with. Mm. Um, but yeah, it is, it, there is there are some options you can use which um, reduce risks. So you can get non-carcinogenic collodions, which use lithium rather than cadmium. But for me, I have used them and I just didn't like the image it achieved it just wasn't for me so I've kind of gone more of a cadmium base some people use an ammonia base as well which um, ammonia obviously is never too great either um, but yeah so I, I buy all my kind of like chemicals from uh, the Czech Republic currently it's a place that kind of pre-mixes it I'm doing some kind of mixing myself at the moment um, but yeah it is all stuff that's very dangerous and the unfortunate thing is as well is when you make an order you've got to be expecting to wait sometimes up to two weeks to get it because you can't fly the chemicals over because again explosive not great planes don't allow that um they have to ship it across and it gets checked at every border because again it's like when it comes i have a whole dangerous goods form on the thing and it's like multiple times it's been signed and stuff like that it's it's not stuff to mess with um but yeah, so basically you can invest in that kind of stuff. Um, the great thing is there's certain companies out there that can offer like packages, which kind of are a way to kind of briefly start into the collodion process. It comes along with a couple of like trays and stuff like that you can use and gives you sheets to film, um, like aluminium sheets to use. Um, but it is one of those things, unfortunately, if you're starting to do it in the UK, it is a bit harder to get hold of the, the chemical equipment that you need, um, mm. unless you start from the get go mixing stuff yourself. But then that's a very in dangerous area because you're operating with a lot of chemicals that if you aren't careful enough, you are going to kind of either um, gas yourself out, you're going to accidentally set fire to your entire house, stuff like this. It's mm. not not stuff to really um play around with i guess but as long as you're careful it's a good time you know like just be safe <laughs> yeah. open a window you know like you'll be fine um no, but it, like it, even though i'm not 100 percent perfect like um when i'm operating inside my dark room i ideally should have some sort of respirator equipment because um i am obviously inhaling heavy metals in the sense of cadmium but then also i'm working around a lot of ether as well and obviously ether is not a really good one to be inhaling too often um there's also a lot of uh, very pure alcohol as well um and it's as much as i say all this i'm actually doing it in a more safe way than when they would have originally done it because yeah. um, the original fix that they would use was actually a potassium cyanide uh, uh, like mixture with distilled water um and it actually funnily enough became uh, being a uh, wet plate photographer back in the day was regarded as one of the most dangerous professions and it was purely just because of people's own idiocy because they would have bottles of pure grain alcohol sat there and they'd be drinking it whilst they're doing these long exposures and then the next thing you know they've accidentally picked up the wrong bottle and then started sipping the cyanide and yeah. whoops you've killed yourself um, and then on top of that as well is you've got all this explosive flammable equipment around but then if you need to varnish the plate and dry the plate you need an open flame, which is also an oh. alcohol burner. So, yeah, there's risks. Um, but for me, it's a, it's a very, very valuable piece of fun to have. Like, um, more than anything, I'm hoping to start doing workshops soon, and I'm going to start doing some uh, adaptions of my equipment to allow people to see what I'm doing a bit more, mm. uh, especially inside the dark room. 
um because I, I want i want to be able to show people how to do it and especially in a safe way because again if it is something if you don't if you don't go into it the right kind of care and like right brain about you 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 could have a very very serious incident and it's it's not something to toy with i mean it's like people on, especially if people are interested in doing it do you know what i mean like if, if like I'd, I'd love to i'd love to have a go i, I would come to one of the workshops you know what i mean like yeah, when you were saying that i was like workshops you've got yeah. to be running some workshops or take something. my money now and i'll, I'll yeah, yeah. um but yeah like don't like don't be scared to do it but at the same time yeah keep your head on learn learn what you need to do but that's i mean if you are going to start doing workshops as well that, that's awesome and uh, i suppose as well you like keeping the art form alive do you know what i mean because there's there can't be that many people that do it i'm sure i'm sure there is but like in comparison to digital photographers or analog oh, yeah they, no, you know what i mean like, i'm care, talking yeah. like the, the, you know scented wise it's got to be a rare art form yeah yeah, I mean, like most of the people who do still continue to do the tintype process, you, you tend to find are people who um, more often than not kind of just do it from a home little studio where they're just doing little bits of still life at home, just to kind of having fun with it. You know what I mean? Um, like I'm, I'm part of a couple of like collodion groups and stuff like that. There's a UK collodion group um, and then I'm part of like a worldwide one. And that there is more people, this is surprising how many people are actively still doing this, even within the UK. But there is that, there is the most of that demographic don't kind of do it for other people. They're literally like taking photos of like stuff like this in their house, just like on a plain backdrop. And like, I've done that, it's good practice, but mm. they're not kind of going out their way to shoot portraits. And they're maybe just not the type of people who like to photograph portraits. Um, so they don't put themselves out there in the sense where their work's kind of seen by the larger masses like the only reason essentially why my work gets seen by probably a larger amount of people is because naturally when i photograph those people they show their friends and mm. they show their family and it's it's more through that yeah. word of mouth that people see it i was going to ask you a question about that because obviously like you know i've now had the experience of you taking portrait of me yeah Mm. I've got that one of one photo. Well, in my case, two, right? But I've got yeah, two different images. But th there's only one of one, and you you didn't have time to quickly pop it home, let it dry, and scan it in quickly. No. How how uh, uh, do you just have to reach out to the people that you photographed, or do they reach out to you and go, you know, I've scanned this in. Here's a digital copy for you. Is that the only way you can see the work again? Um, it does depend because um, there are times where. Um, maybe because for instance i knew obviously you guys were going away um like i just wanted to give it to you there because i wanted you to have that kind of experience straight away i can if i want to take it back home and then just ask for like an address and i'll post it you know like i, I can do stuff like that if i want to um but for me I, I don't know i kind of prefer that sense of feeling of being able to give someone just something they can instantly walk away with because you have this whole experience and then you get to see the final image and i'm like Right, well, I'm going to take it away for a couple of days now. I'm going to go varnish it, scan it, uh, like that. And it's, it's, I think it's too much of a tease at times, you know. Um, but it's, it's one of those things where, for me, as much as I, I having an archive of it all would be absolutely wonderful, and having like a detailed scan of every single one would be great. I obviously take a lot of videos of the stuff that I do. I do like to do my little water bath videos, and for me, I don't necessarily need a high quality scan reminder of it because for me it, it's that whole experience and like that I, I i get what i want from it every time just seeing people have that wonderful reaction to the image and like getting to see their faces light up as the image lights up on the plate like just seeing that water bath clip is enough to remind me of that and that's that's more enough because you've got your own photos as well right like it's not like you you only take photos that you sell to someone I mean, like, obviously, oh, yeah, yeah. Obviously so, you know, I've, your own, you know, you've probably got a house full of them. You know what I mean? So, my my phone is currently sat on top of my box, which is filled with all my other tin types I've done. Yeah. And yeah, so I've got them laying around. I've got a whole drying rack over there with some on them as well. Um, I've sold a couple now. Um, like, there's some laying around the house all over the place. I know there's some in a frame over there somewhere. There's two hanging up. So I just, I went mad with it as soon as I started doing it. That was the problem. And I've just oh, taken up way too much space, taking bloody tin types. Like, 
Mm -hmm. I know I've got one like sat under my table under here and it's not even varnished and I haven't varnished it and I probably don't even plan to because it was literally a test image and I don't care about it. I've got those sat around. I thought you meant it was under your table like you were using it to like lift one of (laughs) them. Oh, that's a great idea. Oh my god, that's ways I can use tin. Photo, great sound product. There you go. Bam. Mm-hmm. Okay, yeah, I'm gonna do that at some point. Yeah, that's a great idea. World's most fantastic um, and expensive <laughs> leveler. I don't know, I don't even know what they're called. Yeah, yeah. It's a nice a little wedge. Yeah, a nice little wedge. <laughs> um but yeah, it's it's um yeah, it, I, I, it takes up space as well. That's the other thing. Um, so as much as I would love to have a physical copy, like eventually those things add up. Like I, you you take a stack of fifty sheets of film compared to a stack of fifty plates, it's it's a whole different level of space that you've got to account for. Um, but yeah, it's it's for me. Um, Again, I, I just like to be able to give someone like something they can walk away with and instantly be happy. So I've just noticed how dark my lighting is now getting. So I'm using the natural light and the sun is disappearing. Um, but yeah, it's maybe my screen. What's that? I've got, I've got the the light turned down on my screen a bit. I thought maybe it was me. Yeah. Oh no, no, I'm just getting dark over there. That's the problem. Um, it's it's, it's, quite, it's quite artistic. It looks quite moody. Yeah, suits me well then um (laughs) but yeah it's um the the whole process um for me like i my the experience i enjoy is the whole actual process of taking the photo and developing it and stuff like that i don't necessarily need to hold on to the plate afterwards um Mm. and again for me it's just one of those things where I, I get the joy I need from seeing people walk away with it, you know, um, and knowing that they go home straight away with this lovely little, little memory that they've got. Um, so, yeah, it's great. I mean, to be fair, you've actually reminded me I've got um, a portrait down there. I need to, I'm going to actually hand deliver it to their house because they live down the road from me. Um, so I need to do that. But um, yeah, it's, 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 it, it is one of those things that, yeah, it, it would be nice to, I guess, archive it and scan it all. But, for me, I already put enough effort in, but... I mean, like, mm. but like photographs are memories, right? At the end of the day, they are memories. Whatever you're choosing to shoot, that, that is potentially a memory, regardless of the actual shooting process or the development process, whether you're shooting digital, analog, whatever. Do you know what I mean? Like everyone has their own reason for taking a photo, right? And oh, if, yeah. your enjoyment is purely taking the photo, knowing that someone's enjoyed it. Yeah. Mad, do you know what I mean? Like I take photos for me, right? I don't, I, I don't care if people always see them. Do you know what I mean? Especially in like yeah. nowadays, like there's this whole like Instagram thing or you know online thing, or should you share your work or should you not? But really, it's about you as a photographer, right? Or you as an artist. Yeah, as a person. yeah. It always should be like it. Every it's it's that whole thing where I don't think necessarily anyone can be considered a better photographer than someone else. Like if you were to go by artistic principles and sure you could put a like a, a gauge on it, but mm. ultimately as long as you're happy with the work you provide, then who can say you're better than anyone else? You know, like it that all that matters in the end is that you're putting out photography that you can feel pride in. And yeah, what if 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 five people like it, wonderful. If five hundred people like it even better you know but just knowing that even those five people can sit there and appreciate the image that you've taken yeah. that's more than enough you know i could be happy like if i got one like on something i'm not going to sit there and be upset about it i'll be i'm looking going hell yeah there's at least <laughs> one other person in this world who likes what i do yeah yeah dude